So um, I would like then to welcome everybody here. Um, this time I will present it because it's my guest. So no technical will do that. So I'm very happy that Suvadip found some time for us to present his work, which is very relevant to what we're doing. We also did a lot on opportunistic networking. And the interesting part is that the connection point between me and Suvadip, who don't know each other very well, by the way, is uh, Dirk Pesci, who connected us and who said that uh, he probably remembers that we're doing also a lot of opportunistic networking and he connected us and uh, maybe all serve as a reviewer for his PhD student, but in any case, we thought it will be good to exchange and to see who is doing what and to see how to do maybe some work in the future together. So Suvadip is, as far as I, as I, as I know and as I understood, is an um, assistant professor in, uh, in BIT, right? And uh, I hope he will also uh, tell us a little bit more about himself. So Suvadip, the floor is yours. Yeah. So yeah, thanks, Sana. Thanks, uh, Tenuka, and all the all the team members of Comnets. So, uh, so my uh, presentation is visible, right? I I hope. Okay. So yeah, thanks, Sana. So I'm an assistant professor. Currently, I'm working uh, at Bits Pilani Hyderabad campus. Um, so Bits is uh, you know it's one of the premier institutes in India. Um, of course, it's privately governed. It's not. Uh, it's not. Um, uh, it's not a government uh, institute, but it's one of the premier institutes. I mean, it's and one of the oldest institutes in India, and uh, uh, it has several campuses. One, uh, three of the campuses are in uh, India. One of them is in Dubai, and uh, so we have uh, a huge intake every year. It's approximately around two, 200 to 250 odd students. Um, they are admitted to the undergraduate courses, and we have the master's program, we have several minors, and uh, we have a very good uh, research facility. We have a number of funded projects. Uh, we have several groups, like we have the systems group, uh, we have the algorithm groups, and uh, we have the, you know, the brain computing group. So there are several groups. Uh, in the computer science department at Bitspilani Hyderabad campus. So that was a bit about uh, our campus. And I uh, graduated uh, in 2016 from Jadavpur University. And um, so um, I, I, uh, I have a few visiting positions uh, earlier after my PhD. And yeah, so that's it about, and of course I do my research in the area of opportunistic networks. Uh, apart from that, I do in um, you know 5G networks and future networks, and of course I try to blend in different concepts of opportunistic networks and how um, they can be implemented in you know the future networks. And that's actually the title of my talk today, uh, where we look at some of the uh, uh, you know scenarios uh, which are still. Uh, not addressed in uh, as far as future networks are concerned and how the opportunistic networks can be helpful in solving those problems. So that's the crux of my talk today. So uh, before going to um, the uh, main topic, uh, so this is an interplanetary network, right? So this, is, this was the inception of uh, the, uh, the delay tolerant network um, uh, in, in way around, around maybe 1998, 2000. Um, and the pioneers, uh, Vin Cerf actually coined this term. And after that, several works have been done on this interplanetary network and how the communication can be done between two planets. So the idea is this, let's say we have uh, several satellites that are rotating around the Mars and uh, there are several satellites which are rotating around the Earth and we want some kind of communication data transform from Earth to Mars. Uh, and as you know that since it's a long haul network, it's a, it's a huge distance between the Earth and the Mars, we cannot have the traditional TCP IP networks um, applicable in such scenarios. Uh, primarily because the variance will be very large, the delay will be large and the packets will simply be dropped from the buffer. So uh, the other way around to solve this problem was to come up with a delay tolerant network where uh, the satellites as, as and when they come in, uh, in line of sight with each other, they forward the packet 
And similarly, uh, they don't, instead of dropping the packet, they hold the packet with themselves. And when uh, they come in contact with the next satellite, they forward the packet to it. So uh, this, is, this is a very simple way of um, explaining how the interplanetary network works. Of course, um, of course, there are deeper concepts to it, which I'm not going. But uh, traditionally, this is how the interplanetary network will work. So, uh, so the essence of this kind of network is that the applications which um, are hosted over this kind of um, protocols, they have to be largely delay tolerant. That means um, we cannot expect a real-time communication in, these, in, in such kind of scenarios. So uh, uh, several experiments have been done um, uh, regarding the communication between Earth and Mars. And uh, uh, traditionally, uh, the packet delivery ratio have been found to be around 90 to 95%. Uh, with a delay of around um, of, of several minutes. I mean, it, it ranges around 20 minutes to even 60 minutes. So there have been large variances, but at least the packets were being uh, were, were delivered between the two planets. Uh, so these are the, some of the other scenarios. Um, so as you can see, uh, these are some of this, these are very old papers um, from where the diagrams have been adopted. So one paper is. Uh, in, in 2006, the other paper is around 2004. So the first figure you can see there is a military communication where there are a group of military personnel who are in the warfare zone and they want a communication uh, with, with, their, um, with some, some kind of warships, which, are, which is very, very far apart. And you can see that there are several uh, you know, intermediate nodes. So these intermediate nodes uh, may be some, some flying vehicles like helicopters or some kind of drones, which are flying to and fro between the war zone and the, and the, and the war craft. Uh, similarly, you can see the second uh, picture where um, we have a remote situation, uh, we have a remote uh, area uh, where we don't have an infrastructure. The traditional uh, uh, you know, uh, cell towers or base station based infrastructure so uh, as a result, we cannot have the traditional internet working there. But uh, imagine a vehicle which has some kind of um, you know, radio access points. And as the vehicle uh, moves near a certain, uh, you know, uh, a certain uh, node, it may be a village home, it may be some, some remote location, the packets can be transferred to that vehicle and the vehicle can uh, deliver that packet to uh, to some internet access point, which may be present in um, in the city, in the in the urban area. Similarly, the packets can travel to the internet and can be uh, uh, can be acknowledged. The packet can be similarly be delivered by the same vehicle and can be delivered to that particular home. So you can see that uh, here we don't have an end-to-end -end connectivity between the source and the destination, but rather we have an hop-by-hop -hop communication where the packets are opportunistically handed over to uh, the traveling vehicle. And as the vehicle reaches an internet access point, the packets are handed over, the data, the data is handed over. Similarly, when the vehicle uh, uh, you know, comes back to the village, the packets can be delivered to that particular locations. And uh, this actually experiment was con conducted in some remote locations of Indian villages uh, and uh, where it was actually successful um, in delivering several large packets. So, uh, so by large packet, I mean, it's not the traditional maximum segment size that we have in our traditional internet, but rather it's the large data packets. For example, it may be an image, it may be some video files as well. So, um, so primary characteristics of opportunistic networks are uh, uh, intermittent connectivity. So we don't have a time and space connectivity between the source and the destination. Uh, as a result, we cannot have the traditional TCP IP uh, mode of communication. Um, and these characteristics can be due to small communication range, primarily because the devices are mobile themselves. So we cannot expect a huge uh, power supply to them. As a result, the communication ranges are quite small. And of course, since the mobiles, uh, since the nodes are themselves mobile, uh, the contact durations between the nodes are very, very small. Primarily because number one, the uh, nodes are themselves mobile. Uh, number two, the communication range are, are, are pretty small. And also since 
the power supply is quite, the power spectrum is smaller. Um, they have a very small bandwidth. So essentially they have a very small data rate. And of course, as I said, they have, they have um, you know, small energy supply. As a result, so even uh, uh, another characteristic is that they have a very small duty cycle. So as a result, most of the time, the nodes will go to sleep just to conserve their energy. Uh, so, uh, this is, so these were the characteristics. The challenges are, uh, of course, the unreliable message delivery. So as we know that we don't have a continuous end-to-end -end path between the source and the destination, uh, the message delivery cannot be a very reliable one as we have in our traditional uh, TCP IP networks. So most of the time, we, uh, the nodes, uh, they follow a, uh, you know, a, re a replication-based strategy, uh, very sort of uh, flooding that we have on our traditional networks. So uh, instead of you know, forwarding only one packet from um, the source to the destination through the intermediate nodes, uh, any particular intermediate node will simply replicate and will uh, transfer the uh, packet to, the, to uh, the encountered node. So uh, as a result, we will have uh, duplicate copies of same message or same packet in the network at a given time. So the primary objective is to improve the reliability, uh, the, the delivery reliability of, uh, of a given message by, uh, you know, by making redundant transmissions. Uh, but the redundant transmissions uh, actually will lead to um, you know, additional overload or it will, uh, it will quickly fill the buffer and the problem of congestion will come in. So, um, so the buffer management is a very important aspect in opportunistic networks. Uh, because, as I said, due to, uh, you know, due to several replicas of packets being in the network at the same time, the buffer will get filled very quickly. Um, the second important challenge is the global network information. So again, since there is no uh, uh, constant connectivity, we don't have a fixed topology. The topology is constantly changing. So we don't have a particular global network information. For example, we, 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 we may not know the number of nodes that are in the network. We, uh, we, we may not know uh, the buffer size of the network, we, uh, of, of the node. We don't know uh, the communication interface. Okay, So all these are the challenges and uh, we don't have any idea about them. Uh, of course, limited computational capability, again, primarily due to low energy supply, and then the node heterogeneity. So some nodes may be may have a weaker interface, communication interface. Some nodes may have a very good interface, uh, communication bandwidth. Some node may be sleeping at some point of time, right? So there will be different scenarios uh, uh, which will actually make the transmission of messages across the network very difficult. Um, of course, I've not mentioned here, the security and trust is another challenge uh, because there may be malicious nodes in the network and uh, the nodes may simply uh, drop the packets uh, um, if the node is a malicious one. So now I'll come to the other aspect and then I'll try to you know, merge them uh, uh, how opportunity networks will actually augment the future network. So um, there are certain challenges of future networks. So when I talk about future networks, I'll be particularly talking about the infrastructure-based cellular networks. Uh, so of course we have the spectrum scarcity, uh, the network densification, uh, which actually leads to the coexistence of various networking technologies, and uh, which actually leads to increasing complexity of network management. So, uh, uh, so especially in the urban areas where we have a huge uh, uh, density of mobile devices, uh, simply due to the population uh, of, of the region, uh, we often have uh, the uh, spectrum scarcity. So for that, uh, the future network um, experts, they propose having a dense network through the deployment of small cell base stations, the femto cells and the, uh, you know, uh, pico cells and all these things. So uh, it actually leads to an increasing network management. And uh, uh, so although at, at a certain point of time, it, it, it leads to an improved bandwidth, uh, it leads to a better application response time, but uh, the core of the network becomes very complex and difficult to manage. Um, the fourth aspect is the quality of service and the quality of experience. Uh, 
Um, of course, there are certain differences between them. Uh, um, so uh, the future network will be primarily be driven by uh, the user applications and the response time, how the user application, how the user is going to feel about a certain application. For example, whenever you're watching a video, uh, how many times your video is getting stalled? Uh, what, is, what is your initial buffering time? Uh, what is the resolution of the video? What is the clarity of the video? Are you getting a very uh, poor quality or are you uh, able to watch the highest quality video? So all these things are uh, you know, primarily driven by um, the quality of um, um, the network, the bandwidth of the network, the quality of your signal. And uh, um, so these are some of the challenges of future networks. Of course, dependability, resilience, and robustness of the network. So we, we don't want uh, uh, we don't want any service failure. Uh, we want 100% service availability at any instant, at any point of time. Uh, and of course, we don't want the network to fail. Uh, finally, we have the energy efficiency. Of course, uh, um, we have these mobile devices. Uh, we don't want the mobile devices to drain their energy, right? And uh, how, uh, efficient we can uh, make our uh, entire network. Of course, we have different uh, we have different again technologies for that. For example, we have green communications coming up as a part of 6G uh, proposal. And finally, of course, mobility is a very important factor. So uh, you can imagine in future we will have vehicles which will travel at the speed of around more than 300 kilometers per hour. Um, so in such cases, it will be very difficult to maintain a constant connectivity between the base station and uh, that particular vehicle. Uh, and of course, the users which, who are traveling inside that vehicle. So all these are you, you know, uh, still um, some of the challenges which are still, which have to be still addressed by uh, the experts and you know, several research papers, several researches, several projects are going across the world, uh, which, have tried, which are trying to address these kind of challenges. And of course, uh, 5G has been um, in the, uh, uh, I mean, it has been an active area of research for quite some time, but now we are also seeing 6, 6G and 6.5G as a new research area. And of course, I mean, just a few uh, years back, um, you know, there were several, several special interest groups that were uh, specifically dedicated to developing the 6G architectures. And um, we have several, um, you know, networking trends. For example, we want the ubiquitous connectivity. As I said, we, we want connectivity every time and everywhere. We want minimum service failure and we want maximum quality of service. Uh, then we have the self-organizing, self-managing and self-healing network, which means that uh, at any point of time, we will have the network. Uh, if any, 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 any uh, component of the network fails, uh, it should be able to uh, rectify itself. Uh, without or with zero uh, or with minimum uh, human involvement. And then of course, we want user experience as a feedback control. So as I said, in future, we are going to see that the network will be primarily driven, driven by the user experience. Um, so uh, the network as it works, uh, will have the user experience, the parameters of user experience as the feedback control. So, um, so there are several vertical areas which have been identified by the special interest groups. For example, we have the de network densification, uh, which realizes primarily the first characteristics, that is the ubiquitous connectivity. And of course, we will see that, uh, that this network densification happens both in terrestrial as well as in aerial stations okay, with physical layer deployments. And then we have the software controlled network devices and applications. Uh, um, uh, which primarily helps with intelligent um, uh, 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 computing. Uh, so as I uh, as we'll see that intelligent computing or you know artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these uh, uh, topics will be an integral part of the network. So of course, edge intelligence, which I'm going to talk about uh, just a few slides uh, later, uh, will be the primary driving factor in improving the quality of experience for user applications. And finally, of course, we have the edge for storage and computing where uh, we want a real time uh, response for the user applications. And this can be possible when we have 
uh, the edge and the fog computing in place. These are some of the horizontals and some of the areas of active research. So we have the small femtocells, we have the low and high altitude platform systems um, where we will have uh, the base stations deployed in uh, maybe the stratosphere uh, zone. We will have the flying base stations, the cell-free massive MIMO, the index modulation, terahertz communication, intelligent reflecting surfaces, device to device communication, etc. And then we have the software defined radio, mobile mobility management, quality of service, uh, resource management, intelligent decision making and security aspects. And then we have the multi-access edge computing and quality of experience-based streaming. So these are several horizontals of future networking um, area, but essentially I'll be talking about uh, these four uh, areas and we'll see how, uh, the, how uh, the opportunistic networking is uh, will, will help in alleviating some of the problems that are there in these areas. So this is uh, uh, a proposed architecture of 6G. So we can see here there are several uh, you know, components of the 6G architecture. So you can see on the left top hand corner, we have this dense small cell radio access network. Uh, which, are, which is connected to the base station through, again, the small cell access points. We have the e-remote health monitoring um, uh, system, which is, again, connected through some, uh, you know, uh, some kind of camera and sensor networks to, uh, again, uh, the cellular base stations. And that, again, can be connected through some kind of flying base stations, for example, some kind of drone networks. And then you can see we have the AR, VR module where uh, the person, they can have some 3D virtual consultation with the doctor, or we can have virtual remote assistance, which is again connected to some kind of, uh, some kind of local uh, wireless access point to the base station. So this is a, you know, a proposed architecture of 6G network. And you can see that this has been adopted from a very recent paper in 2020. So now coming to uh, the multi-hop cellular networks. Uh, so, uh, so as I said, the first component which I was which I'm talking about is D2D communications. And the inception of D2D communications was actually laid uh, way back in the year 2000, uh, when uh, some of the researchers, Ying Da Lin, they proposed the concept of multi-hop cellular networks. So. Uh, um, so you can see that uh, this was published in IEEE Infocom in 2000. So uh, the idea of multi-hop cellular network is to improve the coverage of the cellular networks, especially for the devices which are uh, either in the black hole region or at the, um, uh, you know, at the edge of the cell. Uh, so in this case, it requires, so generally if we don't have the multi-hop cellular uh, we don't have the multi-hop cellular network, it will require a large number of base stations uh, to cater to uh, each devices within the network. And especially if the network is a very dense network, will require a large number of base stations uh, to, uh, to uh, have a 100% reliable and resilient and robust um, service provisioning. But with multi-hop cellular networks, we can have a number of mobile devices uh, which can facilitate uh, not only spectral sharing, but can also act as relays to route the data to and from the base station to the, to the user equipment. And this uh, concept was laid in 2000, which was later actually uh, coined, it was recoined to the concept of device to device communication, and it was approved by the 3GPP LT in release 12. So uh, in multi-hop device-to-device communication, again, there are different kinds of device-to-device -device communication. So it may be a, a device-to-infrastructure communication. It may be a multi-hop device-to-device communication, or it may be a, an ad hoc device-to-device communication. So, uh, um, so in a device-to-device -device communication, uh, it can be either under the control of uh, the base station, or it can be in an ad hoc mode. So if it is under the control of base station and it uses the same cellular spectrum, um, in such case, it's called the underlay network. So, uh, so you can see here in the first figure here, 
So this is a multi-hub device to infrastructure or infrastructure, infrastructure to device communication, where this is controlled by the base station. And when I say it's controlled by the base station, it essentially means that resources are allocated by the base station. Uh, and this is required primarily to reduce the interference between the devices um, uh, so and to uh, provide an optimal uh, service to the different devices which are under the cellular networks. So you can see here that there is some device in between which is acting as relay between uh, the two devices. So you can see here that the data or the signal can be forwarded from this device to this intermediate device, and then it can be forwarded to this device. So this is an infrastructure device to device communication. Apart from that, there can be a simple device to device communication where the communication may again be, uh, it may be uh, controlled by the, it may be under the control of the base station, but there is no data exchange between the base station. It's a simple data exchange between two devices. So again, it can be an underlay network or it can be an overlay network. That is, it can be, uh, uh, the communication can be in the cellular frequency or it can be uh, not in the cellular frequency. And in a completely ad hoc mode, uh, um, it has, um, uh, so in this case, all the devices are connected with each other. Uh, so in, in case of multi-hub D2D, uh, all the devices, they are not connected to each other and some of the devices can act as relays. Whereas in case of complete ad hoc D2D, all the devices uh, are connected to each other in an ad hoc mode, right? So again, this ad hoc communication, ad hoc device to device communication can be under uh, the, uh, it, can be a, it can be the control of base station or again, it, can not, it may not be under the control of base station. Again, if it's under the control of base station, uh, it's, it's an underlay network. If it is not, it's a separate, simply ad hoc network, or it's a simply mobile ad hoc network. So, um, so what are the advantages of device to device communications? So of course, as I said, since the device to device communication uh, uses the same cellular spectrum, uh, we have uh, the we have a better spectrum efficiency. That means, if a certain data needs to be sent from uh, uh, from the base station to a certain mobile device uh, and there is some intermediate device which already stores a certain data. For example, let's say uh, you're traveling in a high speed train, okay? And then uh, there is very some, there is some popular video uh, um, available on the internet and you want to watch that video. Then uh, assume that, assume that there are uh, several people who are uh, watching that same video. So instead of downloading that video directly from the base station, the video can be transferred from that device to another device, right? And so it actually leads to lower power consumption because um, here you're not getting the data directly from the base station, rather you are getting the data from some nearby device, number one. Number two, we require um, a higher data rate primarily because again, the power requirement can be tuned uh, in a better way compared to the infrastructure. And especially this is better when we have a dense network, okay? And then we have improved quality of service. Of course, when I say quality of service, it is in terms of delay. It may be in terms of um, uh, the quality of the video and uh, you know, uh, the, the jitter the delay variance and all these things. And of course, then we have the balance load in, on infrastructure. So when a certain number of devices can be catered by the near devices, of course, the load on the base station will be reduced. So therefore we will have a balanced load on the uh, base station or the infrastructure. So what are the uh, what are the challenges in, uh, in, in, in this kind of scenario? So of course, when I say I want to download a certain content from the nearby device, I have to find out certain device in my, uh, in my vicinity. So there has to be a robust neighborhood discovery process. Of course, mobility management and handover decisions are very important because um, when I want to download a certain content, the mobile devices themselves may be mobile and there may be uh, you know, make and break of links. 
So, uh, so the mobility management have to be an essential component of uh, of such kind of device to device communication. And we have seen that uh, uh, the mobility management primarily stays either in the base station or it's even further uh, uh, in, the, in the core network. Uh, then we have the link stability and service availability. So as the devices uh, you know, move in and out of their communication range, uh, it's very difficult to maintain the link stability and service availability. So uh, of course it's related to the second point, as I said, because uh, the link stability will depend upon the mobility. So if the devices are static, uh, it is, uh, we, we can ensure a better service availability or link stability compared to when the devices are mobile and themselves. Of course, um, uh, we have to consider the handover decision as well. And then of course, the interference between the coexisting device to device clusters, and typically this is more relevant for underlying networks. And then the directionality problem in millimeter wave device to device communication. So uh, of course, um, as you know that in millimeter wave, uh, we, uh, it suffers from severe blockage. So uh, when we have a certain blockage, so it may be a blockage due to some physical object, uh, uh, it may be, the blockage due to some, some kind of uh, intermediate objects coming between the two devices, uh, there has to be a certain way of redirecting the data through some other device in a device to device communication. So how opportunistic networks will help in solving uh, these kind of challenges? So uh, the first problem, as I said, was the neighborhood discovery and the mobility. So, um, so this paper has uh, proposed a best neighborhood selection problem using minimum energy consumed link. So often we have seen that uh, when we talk about proximity between the devices, we, uh, we often consider the Euclidean distance between the devices, uh, which is not often correct, uh, especially when there may be blockages or when there may be some physical obstruction between the devices. So often the best neighborhood selection can be in terms of the, uh, the SNR or, or the SNI, SINR or typically your received signal strength values. And um, uh, how should we uh, select the best neighborhood uh, based on the minimum energy consumed? So let's say we have several devices in our vicinity. So I will select only that device which consumes a minimum energy in the uplink transmission. And uh, this concept has actually been used in several papers for opportunistic networks. So especially uh, when we have a group opportunistic network, that means we have several nodes moving in a cluster formation um, uh, through some mobility using some kind of mobility. Uh, the data is often forwarded to the nodes which consume minimum energy in the uplink transmission. The second uh, point which I said was mobility management and link stability. So, um, so mobility management and link stability has already been addressed in several papers in opportunistic network. For example, as I was saying just a few slides back that since we don't have a constant path between the source and the destination, we often adhere to multi-path routing. That means we uh, replicate the packets and we disseminate it to uh, the several nodes at the same time to ensure a certain delivery of uh, uh, certain delivery reliability. And the same thing can be applied in device to device communication. So uh, instead of transferring uh, the data through a simple uh, uh, or, or rather in through a one path, we can have multiple paths coexisting between the devices. So uh, for example, if I go back to this scenario, so you can see that we have uh, only a single path that exists between uh, this device and this device. Okay. Uh, um, so um, instead of having only one path, if let's say we have several other devices in the vicinity, we can have multiple paths connected to the destination so that if any of the intermediate links get failed, we can, we have, uh, we, we have minimal data loss and the data can be transferred through some other hops. 
So there we um, we need to have minimum uh, mobility management, and uh, we don't have to uh, we don't have to think much about uh, how to uh, consider the handover decision uh, when we have when we have the facility of such multipath routing. So improved improving the cell edge coverage. So of course, as I said, the primary uh, uh, motivation of device to device communication or multi hop cellular communication was to improve the cell edge coverage or coverage extension. So uh, in opportunistic networks, we have already seen that. Uh, uh, so primarily the opportunistic networks was point when we don't have any kind of infrastructured network in place. So, uh, so and of course that is the worst uh, possible case. Uh, typically, typically, as I was saying, in the remote regions. So when we have a multi-hub cellular communication through some kind of opportunistic uh, relays, which act, this actually improves the cell edge coverage. That means uh, we know that at the edge of the cell, uh, the signal strength is minimum. So instead of transferring the data directly from, uh, from the base station to the device, we can have a number of intermediate devices which can transfer data in a hop by hop fashion to the device to device communication. And um, as I was saying in the previous point, we should have, we should not have only one dedicated path from the infrastructure to the device, rather we should have multiple paths to improve the reliability and just to minimize the mobility uh, management task. Okay. And uh, the last point which I was talking here about was the directionality problem in millimeter wave device to device communication. So uh, assume that we have several devices uh, which, are, uh, which are within the vicinity or within uh, the range of each other. And let's say if one of the uh, directional antenna fails, uh, of course, I'm assuming here that they are communicating through millimeter wave and not through some other, other communication te technology. Uh, so we can, you know, we can have, we can redirect the millimeter wave to through some other part or to some other nodes, which can in turn uh, transfer the data to uh, the destination node. So like this, we can select, we can opportunistically select the relays when we have some kind of blockage, uh, uh, especially um, uh, for millimeter wave device to device communication. And you can see that this was, this is not a very old paper. This was published recently in 2017. Next coming to uh, the mobility management. Uh, so as I said, the mobility management is an integral part of future network, especially when we, uh, when we will see that, uh, uh, you know, we will have very large uh, speed vehicles, very high speed vehicles, which are, uh, which which uh, uh, which may carry in the number of passengers or which may carry number of people on that vehicle. So uh, and and when I'm talking about very high speed vehicles, I'm typically talking about speed greater than 300 kilometers per hour. Okay. Uh, so uh, so in mobility management is an is essential primarily because we want to ensure certain continuity of service. We don't want any kind of uh, call drops. We don't want uh, our videos getting stalled for a long uh, duration. Uh, neither do we want initial. Neither do we want a very high initial buffering time. So we want minimum latency. We want uh, minimum handover, minimum handoffs, and we want continuity of service. And uh, this to 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 cater to this kind of problems. Uh, you know, uh, the researchers have come up with small cells and heterogeneous uh, networks, uh, uh, but actually uh, uh, it leads to frequent handovers, primarily because uh, the small cell networks or the, het uh, or the het nets, uh, they uh, use the millimeter wave uh, or the terahertz communication, which actually, um, which actually lead to, uh, and since you know that uh, the power spectrum is uh, dense in a certain direction uh, and, and, and doesn't, it is not that dense in other direction. It requires frequent handovers when the user moves from one 
uh, small cell base station to the other base, small cell base station. And therefore, uh, it requires frequent handovers. So therefore, it requires a very fast and very intricate mobility management as a service on top, on top, of, uh, on top of the control plane. So in this figure, you can see that there is a G node B uh, uh, and there's a vehicle which is, uh, which is initially under the source G node B and then it is moving towards the target G node B. Um, so uh, you can see we have the access and mobility um, uh, framework, which, are, which is typically stationed in the core network rather than in the radio access network. So whenever such, whenever such kind of handoffs are required, the, the G node B has to take the hand, handover decision. And this handover decision can be taken only uh, with the help of access and mobility framework, which is typically in the core network. So often it uh, leads to call drop um, and you know, breakage in the data session, uh, primarily because the handoff uh, uh, incurs a long latency because the decision has to travel to the core network and then finally when the AMF sends the handoff decision or it acknowledges the decision, then the handoff request can be done, um, right? And so uh, this actually leads to a long uh, handover decision. So here uh, to, 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 um, to reduce the number of handoffs and to reduce the latency, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are seeing a very good number of research that are currently going on in um, you know, high, high altitude platform system. So uh, the high altitude platform system is going to augment the terrestrial communication uh, where we will have a flying base station in the stratosphere. So you can see here, there's a stratospheric balloon, uh, which carries a payload. And of course, as you know that since uh, the footprint is very large, it can cover a very uh, large area. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we will have reduced round trip time. So we are expecting a round trip time of around 0.33 milliseconds. And since uh, we can, service a large number of uh, users, uh, of course, since the footprint is very high, will require very small number of handoffs and will also, uh, uh, the handoff latency will be even smaller because you can see that there is only, uh, the handoff latency will require only one round trip, right? So uh, there, it is not that the, hand of decision will first go to the G node B and then it will be taken by uh, the AMF in the core network as we have in the terrestrial communication. So in this case, the hand of latency will be quite lower. But the problem in, uh, for the problem in case of high altitude platform system is that number one, um, they don't have a very, uh, 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 very good uh, life. So uh, the stratospheric balloon, uh, is still in an experimental nature and several uh, you know, projects and experiments are going on. But the primary factor is how to sustain uh, that stratospheric balloon or the stratospheric base station for a very, very long time. Uh, at least we should have that balloon floating in the stratosphere for at least 10 years. Otherwise, <clears throat> it will not worth the cost of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, maintaining the base station at such a height. So, uh, so HAPS can provide integrated service. It can also do some kind of computational offloading. It can provide video service, uh, the industrial IoT service, etc. So I would suggest that uh, maybe we take what you have presented until now, which was a great overview. Thank you very yes. much for that. And uh, just take some more questions, maybe also from the students and hear from the group. Sure, no problem. We have a chance to Ask right. Some questions. Right. Okay, right. Sorry sure. About that. So, um, questions. Okay, maybe I can start. Um, just the balloon, which you presented just the slide before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always found this solution very elegant and very kind of, um, yeah, some interesting. 
but how do you keep these balloon at the same place? Uh, so yeah, so uh, the idea is since it's in, it's in the stratospheric layer, uh, so there we will have uh, you know minimal uh, turbulence. We'll have minimum minimal uh, uh, you know we'll have minimal atmospheric pressure and we'll have minimum turbulence. And of course, uh, there are some form of uh, accelerators and some form of uh, uh, balancers are there, which of course, which, uh, of course, it's on the mechanical side. I'm not aware of that. But uh, the primary reason for hosting them in the stratospheric balloon is that we will have minimum minimum turbulence, and it will it will have you know it will it will have minimal tendency of drifting um, to different locations. Did somebody actually try it out? Whether they really stay there? Yes, actually, there is a project uh, you can see here. There's the Airbus.com. So this diagram has been adopted from Airbus.com. So this is actually a Canadian, uh, uh, a Canadian, uh, um, it's a research Canada, Canada-based research company, and um, uh, they are collaborating with uh, the University of Ottawa. And uh, so there I have a collaborator. Um, I don't know if you may heard the name, um, Halim, uh, Halim, Professor Halim Yanikum So, uh, so there they have actually implemented this and uh, you know, they have come up with very interesting results. And so Professor Halim is actually, um, he has a number of papers on these high altitude platform systems. I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear. I mean, the voice, the audio is quite low. Uh, yeah, so first of all, thank you for your interesting presentation. I have a follow up question to Anna's question, which is mm -hmm. how is the power provided for those balloons? Uh, if the balloon is 10 years in the stratosphere, how do you provide the power for the electronics all that all over the time? I'm not sure I got your question. How is the, uh, the power, the electric power? Yeah, you need to energize the electric circuits on board of the balloon. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. Okay, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, of course, uh, most of the time, either they are, you know, they are battery powered. Uh, we'll have, uh, you know, huge batteries that are that, of course, will be a part of the payload. Apart from that, of course, um, you will have the solar panels. Uh, and of course, since it's in the just in the stratospheric layer, uh, with the solar panel, the, the energy efficiency will be quite better compared to when when you have uh, them in the lower layers. I mean, for example, uh, if you have a solar panel um, uh, um, uh, provided drones, so so the energy efficiency much will be much better in the stratosphere. So yeah, so to answer the question, it's it's either battery powered or it will be, uh, you know, solar powered. Yeah, which means the battery could be used standalone because a uh, battery lasting for ten years. I can imagine that for a sensor node, but I I could imagine it's difficult for such. A... Yes, yes, correct. You are. So that's that's the primary challenge: how to sustain the balloon for for at least ten years. Yes. Hey, uh, maybe you can see. You can hear me, sorry, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks for your presentation. Very interesting. So you you um, uh, discussed a lot of scenarios which are really uh, very interesting. Uh, so my my I mean uh, my questions are always uh, my question is related to scenarios. Because this is one of the things that is very difficult with opportunistic networks in mm -hmm. terms of you know acceptable scenarios. So you you talked about uh, 3GPP, you talked about 5G, and you talked about 6G. Uh, are the specifications uh, discussing about specific scenarios that consider opportunistic networks in these uh, areas or? Are they still sort of research? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. So uh, as of now, they have not gone into the specification. Uh, 
in, 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 in any of the releases, but they are the research, they are still in the research phase. So, um, uh, you know, um, I hope that, you know, the opportunistic network have been there for quite a long time and we have seen, uh, you know, degrading interest among the researchers over the last, you know, maybe, uh, I mean, after 2015, you will not see many papers coming up in the opportunity network, but surprisingly in the last uh, few years, maybe after 2018 or 19, uh, the number of research papers that are coming up, not only in the journals, but in the conferences as well, uh, is growing. Uh, the primary reason is that uh, the opportunistic network can now uh, be integrated with uh, now of the some of, number of concepts. For example, as I was saying, uh, the, you know, the opportunities, we have the opportunistic device to device communication. We will have the directionality problem of millimeter waves. Uh, in several cases that it has been shown to improve the cell coverage, uh, extend, extend, the cell, uh, extend the cell coverage. So yeah, so it is still not in the specification in any of the releases, but yeah, it's still in the research phase. But I, I, I hope that it will, it will, it will, uh, it will, uh, uh, the researchers will still uh, find it interesting and it will, they will actually use this to improve the performance of the network. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, thank you. This is, this is one of the things that we always discuss. And I mean, uh, apart from all this research, uh, research, rather, what is your opinion? I mean, wh wh where do you see opportunistic networks in the, in the future? Uh, so, um, so, you see, opportunistic networks was uh, actually, uh, I mean, in, in actually the inception was primarily there to support uh, the communication in, uh, in, in, in the remote areas in, in case of disaster scenario, uh, in interplanetary networks where the traditional TCP IP based network uh, uh, could not be, uh, you know, um, so in such kind of scenarios, the opportunistic network and the delay tolerant networks were used and there are very few applications. So uh, actually I was coming to them in, in, in a short while. So, um, so I think you have heard of this open garden that was a very, you know, it's a, it's a real life application uh, that was very popular during the Hong Kong protest. And then we have the UEPA, uh, um, which, which is actually yet another application, uh, which was developed uh, for alpine safety. Uh, in, 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 I mean, typically I, I don't remember, but uh, I think in Finland or in Norway somewhere, uh, this application was developed. Um, so to answer your question, I see that uh, the way opportunistic network was used till now, uh, similar kind of concepts will not be there, but uh, now it will be used uh, in a different sense. For example, if you tell me that uh, whether there will be a bundle protocol and whether these RFCs, whatever RFCs were developed for opportunistic network uh, will be there or not, I am not sure whether this bundle protocols and other um, uh, specifically transport layer protocols, which were developed for opportunistic network specifically will be used, but that opportunistic network paradigm will be there. And um, this opportunistic communication paradigm will be there, uh, which will be used and it will be helpful uh, in future networks. But if you tell me whether the specifications which were developed specifically for opportunistic networks, for example, the bundle protocol uh, and the other uh, you know, uh, you know, interplanetary network transport layer protocols. I don't think they will be, uh, you know, very popular uh, in the coming days. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 